Let us look at John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I, at what I've said to you. You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel and yet do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except for the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that, who, so that anyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light that comes into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because of their evil deeds. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come into the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may, might, may be seen clearly that their deeds have been done in God. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. A number of years ago when my wife and I were living in Philadelphia, that's actually where we met. Um, we had struck up these friendships with other young married couples. None of us had children yet. We were all either, well, they were all professionals. I was still finishing up my graduate school. And one of them had a birthday, and we decided to all go out for dinner one night. And as we're sitting there around the table, uh, whining and dining and just having a really good time, I noticed that there was a new couple that was joining us, someone that I had never met before. After a while, the faldera and celebration was done, the mood became a little subdued and everyone started to break off into their own little groups and have their own little discussions. Now, about this time when we would all gather, um, you would find me sitting alone sitting there supping my coffee or my tea or whatever um, distilled beverage was at hand, and just kind of watching what's going on. I wasn't a physician, which one of them was. I wasn't a professional chef and food manager. I wasn't a banker. I wasn't a travel agent. I wasn't any of these things. I was in school to be a pastor, and while all of them had an appreciation of God, the discussion of the subject kind of creeped him out. And when people gather socially, if you don't have children, what's the thing that you start talking about? Your work. Well, they didn't want to talk about my work. So I would sit there and listen a lot of times, making a side comment here and there. Except for this couple, Grace and Niall. Niles joined in with the, with the couple with the guy that was studying to be the transplant surgeon in his residency, for he himself was halfway through his medical training. So they had a lot of things in common to discuss. Grace was 
finishing her Master's of Social Work and was just kind of sitting there quiet. And she finally leans over to me and says, so what do you do? Now, at this time, in seminary, I was doing my first interim transition work, like what I do with you folks. And I explained it to her, and I expected the conversation to come to an end, because a lot of times that's what would happen. And she looks at me and she says, so do you have to be born again to do what you do? And <laughs> after I was shocked, I kind of went, why, yes. You see, my, my, my smart aleck remark was to say it wouldn't hurt, but I figured it was best to be serious in the moment. And I said, well, yes. And she looks at me and she says, what exactly does that mean? I was born and raised in the Anglican Church. I was baptized as, a, as an infant. I was raised with the catechism. I do not understand this term, born again. So I spent the next couple of hours talking with her trying to answer her question. First, trying to understand the catechism training that she came out of so I could then equate what it means to be a true Baptist Protestant being born again, going through the waters again, what all that means. And she kept asking questions that would give hard, factual, concrete answers, which was she was accustomed to receiving in her church upbringing. And I kept answering it's about the spirit. It's about giving yourself. It's about, you know, letting yourself be renewed, not going back to the old ways. None of it concrete. And she sat there and was more and more and more confused. We had socialized with those couples a number of times before we ended up moving to Connecticut for me to start my first church. But I never saw Grace and Niles again. And I would ask the folks that invited them, hey, what's going on with Grace and Niles? And I would go, eh, I don't know. It was like they fell off the face of the earth. I would say that's the closest encounter I've ever had to what's going on with Jesus and Nicodemus right here. We are only in the third chapter of John, and the Gospel of John was written at a particular time towards the end of the first century when Christians were being persecuted and they were trying to understand, is this being a child of God, a follower of Jesus, a member of the way, is it really worth it? Does God really get it? And John's testimony reveals the suffering and the struggle that Jesus himself and the disciples and the new believers all went through to help them say, yeah, God gets it. In the end of the previous chapter of chapter 2, Jesus has gone through and cleaned out the temple at the time of Passover. He made a whip. He drove out the money changers. He drove out the animal sellers. He really set everything on its edge saying, hey, you all are focused on the wrong things. You need to be focused on the things of the divine, not the gold that can go in your pockets. You need to let God, the Spirit, something you can't touch but only experience, guide you instead of going by these factual traditions of laws and Talmud that you've embraced and purported for unknown centuries. He was trying to break the bonds and allow them to be open to the movement of the Spirit rather than be stuck in the rut that they had been for at least two and a half to three centuries. They had heard about him changing the water into wine. They had heard his teachings and seen the signs and the wonders, in other words, the miracles that he had performed after he'd driven the money changers and the animal sellers out of the temple. After all of that, Nicodemus comes. Nicodemus, think of him as a member of the president's cabinet. He wasn't the leader, but he was a leader of leaders. He wasn't number one, but he sat and worked very closely with the one who was. He was an expert in his field of the law. He would be able to quote you chapter and verse of the various scrolls. He could argue the interpretations of Talmud till the cows came home. He was no slouch. He was smart. He was gifted. He was important. And he comes to see Jesus by night. Some argue that it was under the shroud of darkness so no one could see him. 
yes. But John is filled with symbolism and dualism. You will read one thing and you could assume and interpret it one way or you could interpret it another way. He came by the cover of darkness so no one can see him. But you could also translate that he came in darkness because he could not see and understand himself. And you can get to that conclusion by the questions that he asks Jesus. And he doesn't talk to him like, I am a member of the elite and you're a lowly schmuck. He talks to him as an equal, a learned man, a respected man. Things that, that, he, that Jesus can do that he himself doesn't understand, put in awe, and instead of just talk it down, he appeals to it in grace, tries to understand it. We know that you are a teacher who comes from God because no one other than God can do these things. So he's setting the tone. We are equals. But the interaction changes from there. Nicodemus is looking for a road map. And Jesus instead is giving him a testimony. A road map gets you from point A to point B clearly, efficiently, effectively, where you don't have to waste a lot of time. It's really as straight as line as possible so you can get there as quickly as you can. But when you have a testimony and a personal journey, it's not about getting there the fastest. It's about how you get there at all. Who guides you? What guides you? Who do you trust? How do you recover? How do you survive? What is the basis of all of this? And Nicodemus isn't getting it. He wants to just know the quick and easy, how can I know? How can I make it happen? Let's just fix it and move on. Give me the special answer. It's like, let me pay the ticket and my fine and move about my way. No transformation. No change. No conviction to live as a child of God in a different way. You see, at the end of chapter 2, when Jesus did all these signs and wonders, many people came to be believers in Jesus. But at the end of John, second chapter of John, it says Jesus did not believe them because he knew their hearts. They got all caught up in the excitement of the moment and said, yep, I want that too. And Jesus went, when you really think about this, let's see if you've really given your heart over to it. Nicodemus could be doing the exact same thing. That looks cool. That looks great. That's the latest and the greatest. It's giving me what I want. Wow, look at how wonderful it is. I want part of that. And Jesus is saying, well, you need to change your focus. As I went through and read this passage, I'm watching this encounter between a man who is trying to understand and the one who can guide him and take him where he needs to go. And it's not an issue that Jesus is being confusing. Jesus is giving us words that we need to think about. It's what Nicodemus is expecting in that encounter. What did he expect when he encountered the Messiah? Likely for ourselves, what do we expect when we want to speak and work and walk with Jesus? At the end of my conversation with Grace, I kind of looked at her at the end and I said, you know, you're wanting to understand being born again, but I'm trying to understand what is your expect expectation when you come and enter into this relationship with the divine? And she went, I'd never thought about that. I said, well, think about that. And then it'll be easier for you to understand my answer. Sometimes we just see all these people getting on board and having these wonderful things, being filled with the Spirit, have a joy that goes beyond comprehension, and we go, we want that too, but then we hear what's required. Well, take time and meditate on the Word every day. Commune with other Christians. Pray together. Allow yourselves to be open, to be changed by what the Spirit is doing so you can see what God is doing in your life and in the lives of others. And we look at that and go, oh, that's a lot of work. What relationship that you deem important isn't work? Think about the relationship with your spouses alone. How hard do you got to work on that sometimes? 
You see, the key to a beautiful relationship is having a good friendship to begin with, especially in a marriage. Because there are days that you don't love that individual that you said, I do, till death do us part. There are days you don't like what they're doing. There are days you don't understand a honking word that they're saying, and you're just trying to understand what do they need when they say, get me this. And you're trying to understand what this is, and then you're trying to figure out where it is, and then after a couple of days of searching, you realize you ain't got it. How do you react? Do you go to your loved one and say, you bonehead? Or do you go, um, sweetheart, I'm not finding it. I'm not sure we have that. Are you sure you're thinking about the same thing I'm thinking about? Now, depending on what your spouse is like or your good friend or whatever, they're either going to say, you, and fill in the blank. Or they're going to stop and they're going to go, hmm. Well, now that you mention it, I really don't know. It takes a level of investment and maturity, a willing to be open and vulnerable and to be proven where you can be really right and totally and completely wrong to have that relationship grow and become a foundational, solid fixture of your life. It's the same thing when we seek to have a relationship with God through his son. You can't just be given a road mat, say, do these things, okay, you're fine. It's a daily investment. Jesus says, you know, you can't understand these unless you're born from above, unless you come from God. And it's not that you are touchly and magically anointed, it is that you've given yourself to God and God is filling you, guiding you each and every way. Nicodemus didn't understand this because he had spent his entire life, since probably age of four, being immersed in the traditions and what it meant to be a Jew. And not just what it meant to be a Jew in the rites and the rituals, but also in the laws and the many applications because he was born into the sect of the Pharisees. So they didn't know just the bare minimum. They knew it extensively. There was a joke that we had in seminary. So did you read that article that professor and so-and-so wanted you to? Yup, I read it like a Pharisee. That meant I read it backwards, forwards, inside out, upside down, and inverted a couple ways, and then looked at it in a couple of other languages just to make sure I got it. There was no question you couldn't ask me that I would not be able to answer. That's what it meant to be a Pharisee of the Jews. There was no question about the Jewish faith that they could not answer. If they couldn't, then they weren't doing something right. They knew everything, and now here's Jesus, and there's something that Nicodemus doesn't know. How often do we come unto the Savior, put ourselves before the cross, seeking guidance, seeking rest, seeking peace, seeking answers, and what we're given, we just don't get. It confuses us. It confounds us. It wants to position us in a place that we don't want to be, and then it angers us. Sometimes we bargain. Well, God, if I do it this way, can I accomplish the same thing? Other times we just go, yeah, no, and we take it into our own hands. And there are other times we just kind of go, and don't do anything about it. Nick's not giving up. He goes for round two. How can this be? And he gives a rational, logical, anatomical, and physiological answer that is an impossibility to the spiritual answer. Now, for me, if I was Nicodemus, my answer wouldn't be, how do I re-enter my mother's womb? My question is, how would her body be reconstituted from the cremain so I could enter the womb? That is the logic the practicality, the physical manifestation of how does it work that Nicodemus is asking. 
Now, I think Jesus is very graceful. I don't think he's saying, Nick, you're an idiot. I think he says, let me try to explain this again. So he explains it again. Nick still doesn't understand it. Jesus explains it again. Nick still doesn't understand it. Explains it one last time, and because Nicodemus does not understand, he leaves. Back in and through the darkness. He left the exact same person he was when he came and had an encounter with God's Son, our Savior, the Messiah. Do we live exactly the same when we encounter our God? When we feel the Spirit move? When we see an amazing element of testimony or revelation happen before us, do we leave the same person or are we changed somehow? Are we asking questions? Are we seeking to grow? Are we wanting to understand better? Are we wanting to be able to have the same sense of God's presence in our lives? If we do, then we are fulfilling the, the sending of Jesus by growing every time we encounter that we become something more, something better, something more aligned to be a child that receives God's grace and can extend it to others. But if we leave exactly the same person, unscathed, unfazed, unmoved, then we come and go in the darkness that we came and went with. Jesus is appealing for Nicodemus' soul. And the only reason why it's not changed is because Nicodemus is looking for that which Jesus is not offering. He's looking for the faith to kind of fit into the forms and confines and the categories and the boxes of how he's set up his life. Tell me what slot I can plug this into and leave it there. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You take your plan and you let God envelop it. He doesn't fit into a compartment. He is the vessel that contains it all. And Nick just kept wanting to put God in a box. Put him into a rule. Put him into a law. Put him into an application or an explanation that he could find in the scrolls. And this is a guy who should have understood what the signs and wonders of Messiah would be when they were going to be revealed to the people of the earth. Right there in Jerusalem, in that temple, he was doing the things that was foretold and prophesied about that Messiah would do. And of all people, Nicodemus should have understood, and he didn't. Now, I don't mean to be insulting by saying this, but I know that I'm sitting in a room with people who have been Christians a lot longer than I've been alive read your Bibles, come to church, did your prayers, gathered in fellowship, and if to this day, if you're still not growing, every time you have a holy encounter, something is disconnected, something is broken, there is something blocking, and I guarantee it is not from God, it is happening within ourselves. One of the greatest discipleship materials I've ever read, Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby, basically said, if you're not feeling that divine connection, don't try to understand where God has made the mistake. God is doing what God has always done, eternally pouring himself into this world. The question is, how are you receiving it? Are you open to receive it on God's terms, or are you trying to receive it on your terms? Personally, every time I try to make the relationship I have with my Lord on my terms, it gets pretty ugly, pretty messy, pretty screwed up, really, really, really fast. But if I allow myself to be guided, even into places and people and things that I don't care about, I don't want to give time to, takes away from the tick list that I need to get done for that day. My journey, my life, my place with the divine is so much better. That's allowing ourselves to be born of water and spirit. Two very important words mentioned here in John, two 
excuse me, words that Nicodemus should have clearly understood. Water is looked at as a mean of ritual cleansing in this case. It is not only life, but it is also that which gives life. You water the ground where you put seeds to grow, you get plants, you get vegetation, you are able to feed someone. Same thing if you water an animal, it gives it life so they can then feed you. But it's also used to wash away that which blemishes you and makes you dirty. In a spiritual sense, in the Jewish sense, ritual baptisms were very common. Not what we do where we take you and dunk you in. It was a it was like our baptistry with steps at one end and steps at the other. You entered in one end, walked through, and came out the other. Now, the most popular group that did this were known as the Essenes. But it was not uncommon in biblical archaeology to find villages and homes that had such baptismal two pools where the families would ritually go through and cleanse themselves. Well, when it comes to our own journey of faith and our own confession of faith, we go through waters to be as a symbol of the conviction of being purified by the Spirit, wanting to not be what we once were, but to walk as a new creation as God has called and created us to be. Water is a symbol of cleansing for purity. And Spirit, Spirit is the symbol of God's presence. It comes and it blows, you know, like I feel the wind coming off the fans and the air conditioners. I know where it's coming from. There's a motor that's driving it all. But when you're outside and you feel the wind ripping around, do you look for the source? If you're out working in your yard and it's really hot and the wind starts to blow, do you look for where it came from or do you just stand up and open yourselves and let it cool you off? Maybe I'm the only one that does that. <laughs> You don't question where it's come from. You just know that it's there. You trust it. You enjoy it. You relish in it. Well, the Spirit of God, the Ruach, it's supposed to be the same thing. You don't always know where it's coming, and you don't always know where it's going, but when it's there, you feel it, you relish in it, you enjoy it, and you let it do what it's going to do in your lives. And that allows you to be renewed because... You're a little cooler than you were before. I don't know, when I get hit by a good breeze, I feel refreshed and energized, especially if it's after a good rain. Just that life-giving aroma. Just, okay, I can take on the world. I imagine the Spirit of God being the same thing. When we take that in, there ain't nothing we can't face in this world, individually and as a body of Christ. You heard the list of prayer requests. Pretty heavy stuff. And in each one, asking God, his spirit, to come and be with the person who is infirmed and the people who are being affected by that. It's not out of duty. It's out of a fervent request and a personal knowledge that when the spirit moves, beautiful and wonderful things happen. And that always comes from above. The God who created us in his image so that we can be vessels of his love and presence of his grace. But that doesn't come to pass unless we know what we're looking for in the relationship. What do we seek when we encounter Jesus? What are we looking forward to when we walk in the doors to our church building? What is our hearts and minds hungry for when we walk in the doors to our sanctuary? How are we wanting to be moved when we see the words up on the screen and the sunlight coming through the cross? How do we adjust when we have the blinders come in our lives, like that sun coming through the window and it painfully blinds me sometimes? I have to move so I can do what I need to do. Sometimes we need to move away from the blinders we have as well so the Spirit can do what the Spirit's going to do. This interaction John records, and he's putting it out to us readers and listeners. If you're coming to come unto God, come open with no agenda, and let God take care of the rest. Which, yep, yeah, those are words that are simplicity, but look at it this way. I didn't create the cosmos I didn't create this earth, 
And I didn't create all the life on it. God did. And if God can do all of that by simply saying, let it be, what can he do for us when we allow ourselves to be in his embrace, to be part of his plan, to grow into the people that we have been created and called by the Spirit to become? It all comes down to what we're looking for in the relationship. And for me personally, that is to be a child of God who goes into the world, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching all the things that Jesus has commanded and taught of me to others. That's not my quest as a pastor. That's my calling as a Christian. As a pastor, I'm supposed to teach you how to do that. <laughs> Give opportunities to grow. Give opportunities to engage. Give opportunities to have you see the beauty and wonder of a God who loves you so much that he sent his only child to die for our sins. That blows my mind. That scares me a little bit. And it excites me all at the same time. And every day that's going to unfold differently. I'm going to learn something new. I'm going to see God unfold in a different way. And my hope and prayer is when I get to the end of each day, I can give thanks for it. Now that's for me and what I seek every day. What the rest of us have to do if we haven't asked that question is to be real with ourselves for a few moments and say, when I encounter my God through his son at the cross, what is it that I'm looking for? What is it that I seek? Because none of us should have to live in the darkness that Nicodemus does. Instead, we should all be able to celebrate the blessings that God gives to us each and every day. Would you all pray with me, please? Amazing God, we live lives that can be very, very busy and very, very messy. But you are there. Help us to not have the mess and the busyness plunge us into darkness, but instead allow us to become children who see and relish you in your light. To be vessels of your light and your grace amongst us each other and amongst those that we contact in this world. Use us and be with us, O oh God, with each step and every thought. In your Son's name we ask. Amen. It's, to me, it's one of the most important questions to ask in our faith and to keep evaluating in ourselves. What is it they're looking for? How do we hunger? How do we thirst? And how do we take that and share it with others? There are a lot of books out there that give you step-by-step -step instructions. And quite honestly, all, they all overlook the exact same thing, leaving room for the spirit to change the plan. Or at least my plan, my human plan, to always keep me focused on God's plan, God's purpose. God's calling, God's presence. Nick didn't get it. I would really like to see Grace again someday and to see how she's doing in her journey. To see if I did any help or any harm all those years ago. But just to see if how she's grown and to see if there's any way that I can help. Maybe that'll happen. I'm not dead yet. The future's still unfolding for me. But as for you all, it's still unfolding as well. So as you get ready to head for the picnic, and then after that, as you go from this place, take what you've heard. Take what you felt. Think about it. Pray about it. Wrestle with it. 
And if the Spirit calls you to, apply some of it to your lives. But as you go from this place, do not be afraid, do not be embarrassed, do not be surprised that you all are children of God. Go in grace, be filled with this peace. Have a good week, everybody. Amen.